Very good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining this fireside chat with Mr. Jamshed Godrej, past president, CII, chairman and managing director of Godrej and Voice, on a subject that is, you know, very important and critical, not only for all of us here in India, but a problem which I think the world has to come together to solve and is looking to India, you know, to provide leadership. And the person who's providing leadership to this cause in India is the one we have with us. Really honored and privileged to have you here, Jamshed, with us on a subject called India at 100 towards green prosperity. Uh, I think you represent a, a brand and, a, a, you know, I think an ideology that resonates with everyone in India. You know, the Godrej brand probably touches an Indian every day uh, in multiple ways, <laughs> you know, and hundreds of millions of those. Uh, so I don't think, you know, anyone really needs an introduction to what you have contributed or what, you know, your brand and Godrej has contributed to both India as well as to the world. Uh, but, you know, I must specifically mention about some of your roles, uh, you know, as a chairperson of the Board of Directors of the Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation, India Resources Trust, Council on Energy, Environment and Water, you know, you're a director with the Climate Works Foundation, World Resources Institute, you know, in the US, and a trustee of the Worldwide Fund for Nature. So, so many causes that you have personally stood by, believed with, uh, with CII, you chair the CII Sorabji Godrej Green Business Center, you know, which has created the largest number of green buildings in the world, second only to the US in a matter of the last 15 years, a very big agenda, which was, you know, for CII and for Indian industry over the last 15 years. So really great to have you here, Jamshed. And what we will do is have a conversation around the next 25 years, you know, as Prime Minister Modi and the government likes to mention, you know, is the Amrit Kal of India. It's a big opportunity for us as a country to be able to capitalize. And maybe we can begin with, uh, you know, that as we really chart this roadmap towards building an aspirational blueprint, you know, for what we will be in 2047 and really look at the next 25 years, you know, what is your dream and vision? Like if you were to see India waking up 25 years from today, you know, what would you like to see? Yeah. Well, Rajan, let me first of all say how pleased I am to have this uh, chat with you. Uh, you have uh, also, you know, done so much to promote the idea that uh, CII and in India should look forward uh, as as we grow, you know, to to a better uh, future. And uh, it's good that we are talking about something when India is 100 years old in uh, 2047. <clears throat> my, my biggest uh, aspiration and dream is that, you know, we have changed the landscape of India from, from the way it has been to one where <clears throat> we have, you know, every single person is... Uh, has been taken not just out of poverty, but also leading a reasonably good life. You know, I think it's important uh, for us to recognize that, uh, you know, India's uh, per capita uh, GDP or income is actually very, very low from a global perspective. And unless we are able to actually change that situation, you know, we are not actually going to be able to <clears throat> think of India as a developed and developing country because we still have uh, a huge legacy uh, of, uh, you know, our countrymen and women uh, who really have not been taken along the development path. And uh, from my point of view uh, and, and, you know, my my history and my family's history, et cetera. I think how to, you know, create the growth, which is equitable and one which really makes a difference to every individual in India is I think uh, the most important uh, dream that I would have. And I would say that 
for anybody today in India who is living and working in India, uh, you know, this is something that we have been uh, worried about and concerned about for a long time. You know, I mean, if you take the mission of CII, for instance, you know, what is the mission of CII? To see India a developed country, to see that we have equitable growth, to see that we have sustainable growth, to see that, you know, India, uh, its position in the world is, is recognized, not just, uh, you know, because we have a large population, but because we have achieved a lot. And I think that that is the sort of uh, uh, thought that, that, that really sort of uh, uh, excites me uh, in everything uh, that I do. Uh, and, and, it, and it is important that we recognize <clears throat> that our growth has been uh, sort of uh, not very equitable, uh, that our growth has not been sustainable, uh, that our growth, you know, is, is uh, uh, been sort of imbalanced. I mean, you, if you see the number of people uh, in India who are in agriculture, you know, partly or fully, you know, uh, it's, 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 that is completely unsustainable. We have to move to more uh, value added and higher value uh, uh, employment. Uh, that's the only way that we are actually going to be able to feel that India has developed. And the other part, of course, is that <clears throat> to support the growth, we need infrastructure. But when I say infrastructure, it's not about roads and airports and dams and all that sort of thing. It's more about the social infrastructure, the social fabric uh, of India is what has to really make a difference. You know, we, we are proud that we are a democracy. We are proud that we are uh, many, many different voices uh, with different ideas, different dreams, but all aiming towards seeing that we have uh, an India which is equitable and an India which uh, everybody, uh, you know, is sort of taken out of poverty. So I think that that is really uh, important as we uh, think of India uh, by 2047. No, I think, uh, you know, you've hit the nail on the head, Jamshed. And I think that's the, you know, I think the driving sentiment, you know, around which a large part of everything that society, industry, government, you know, can do, right, to make that happen. Obviously, to make things equitable and inclusive, affordability, you know, continuing to drive better performance, lower price by industry, increasing manufacturing, you know, so many aspects will need to all happen. You know, employment, what you rightly said, you know, education, building capability, India serving the world <laughs> through its human capacity. So many aspects, uh, you know, get covered by just that, you know, that one point. And, and I think uh, it, it kind of is the foundation and building block, you know, for the future. So thank you for, for, for you know, that very powerful uh, opening remark. But, you know, uh, you know, one of the other conversations today, Jamshed, is, is really about, you know, us also being able to contribute to green prosperity, you know, by 2047. I think that's a, a very, very key. I don't know whether I would like to say a challenge for the world, but an opportunity for India, you know, because there's so many things we have to build from scratch rather than, you know, transform or, you know, do things like that. So how do you envision, you know, India kind of achieving its dream of green prosperity by, you know, 2047? Yeah, Rajan, actually, you know, we have to look at this from both a historical perspective and a perspective of looking forward. You know, India has not been uh, part of uh, rapid industrial growth uh, over the last 100 years. You know, as a result of that, uh, its emissions per capita is still extremely low, probably one of the lowest uh, in the world. and. I mention this only because I think uh, I'm echoing the words uh, of a former prime minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, when he, when he said that when you look at climate change and development, India should never aspire to grow 
the way that the rest of the world, the Western world has really grown, that it should aspire to limit our per capita emissions to the average of the world or lower. And, and not say that, you know, uh, the way we grow is actually going to result in high emissions. So this is a very important uh, aspect. I think our government today has taken on this ambition of uh, India becoming a net zero country uh, in the next 70 years. Uh, it's taken on the biggest challenge of converting uh, a country which is so dependent on coal for its power to one which is much less dependent on coal uh, and much more dependent on renewable energy. You can solar, you have wind, you have biomass, you have all sorts of other opportunities uh, uh, for uh, uh, producing energy. And also efficiency. You know, we, we cannot say that we are going to produce energy without thinking about its energy use and the fact that the energy will have to be used efficiently, you know? So in all these areas, we've made great strides, you know? We've, there's no doubt about it that, uh, you know, we are moving in a direction uh, which will allow us to be uh, an economy based on renewable energy. But the challenge today is huge and enormous. You know, I mean, just to put it uh, in a simple way, you know, with, with even with an average of 6% growth, uh, you know, the demand for energy is going to be enormous. And today, the only energy source that we have, which is reliable, is a fossil-based one. So how to transition from a fossil-based energy uh, profile to a non-fossil based energy profile is a huge challenge. It's not only building solar power plants and wind plants and uh, looking at bio, bio uh, waste and things like that. It's about the entire economy. You know, you have to not only produce the energy, you have to get it to the place where it's being used. You have to do that efficiently. You have to manage it in a way that is market oriented uh, in by, uh, by the use of uh, uh, proper economic uh, arguments on tariffs, et cetera. So <clears throat> this is a massive challenge. And for a country of the size of India, I think we don't realize you know, how big a challenge this is going to be. And at the same time, we are in our lifetime now, we are experiencing huge amount of global warming. You can, you know that, you know, when, no matter which part of the world you're in, the fact is the average temperature in the world has gone up significantly. And in fact, a few days ago, uh, we were told that, uh, you know, we've just uh, crossed the hottest day in the world, you know, based on an average of uh, temperatures from all over the world. So I think this second challenge, uh, in addition to the first challenge, is such that you are going to need much more uh, home appliances and other appliances and other interventions on cooling. Now, cooling, as we know it, is also very energy hungry, you know, which means that you have to figure out how do you, how do you create uh, a system of cooling you know, which is, which is holistic. So you have to look at urban planning. You have to look at the way that uh, our streets are designed. You have to look at how much green cover there is. So what are those natural ways uh, of, of being able to reduce the temperature in a big city, you know? <clears throat> and what are the other industrial ways, you know, using air conditioning and other interventions? like evaporative cooling, etc., that you can start bringing the temperature down in summer. Because we know from past research that productivity is very much based on, you know, temperature. If, if you have people working in, in the field, you know, out in the open in 40 degrees centigrade uh, temperatures, you know that their productivity is going to be greatly affected. Their health is going to be greatly affected. You know, 
So these twin challenges that we have today of growth requiring energy and the heating of the planet requiring more energy for cooling, these two are converging. And this is creating a bigger challenge when we have to move to renewable energy. So the pace at which we have to grow our uh, renewable energy sources is way beyond and way higher than anyone else in the world, just because of the size of India, the number of its people, and, and the geographic spread, etc. So these challenges are going to be huge and humongous. I know that our government has made very, very ambitious targets. Uh, it's not that they cannot be met. They can be met. But they need policy reinforcement. You know, whether at the central level, at the state level, uh, the local level, everywhere. Uh, and we will need those policy changes to take place quickly so that, you know, uh, in a rapidly industrializing, rapidly urbanizing India, you know, how are you going to manage these challenges? We know that urbanization is something that, you know, you cannot avoid. It's going to happen. It's happening. And, and that's where also the high paying jobs are. Uh, so if you want high quality jobs, uh, urbanization is essential, but then how do you, how do you urbanize in a sustainable way? You know, what are those basic uh, points? Uh, we've all got used to using private transport. You know, how soon can we move to public transport? Every one of us, you know, why, why is it that uh, <clears throat> we, we are not using public transport today? Okay, we know the reasons. It could be convenience. It could be you know, many, many, it doesn't go to every place we want to go to. There are many reasons for it, but you have to grow those ideas. And there are many good ideas on urbanization, on public transport, on cooling. Uh, and the other biggest challenge is going to be agriculture, because so many of our Indian brethren, you know, are involved in agriculture. And agriculture today has to become more productive. I think we have to learn to uh, grow the type of things uh, that are not, not just in demand in India, but uh, demand globally. Agriculture is a, is a global commodity. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a commodity that uh, if we are good at doing certain things, that's what we should be good at doing and selling to the world and buy the other parts that you know, other countries may be more uh, suitable for. Uh, I mean, take a Take uh, cooking oil, for instance. You know, we are so dependent on the import of palm oil uh, as a cooking medium, you know. So how are we actually going to change all these uh, habits uh, in a way that will allow us to become more sustainable? Because the problem of palm oil, as we all know, is that it grows in tropical areas where there are rainforests. And if you're going to cut down the rainforest to grow palm oil, you have a challenge. So these are the, the sort of things that we will have to face up to. No, I think, you know, you've so beautifully outlined, you know, the different levers, you know, that can, you know, affect this transition or at least the space of this transition. And, you know, Jamshed, if we add to it, right, when you talk of global interdependence, you know, there's a pandemic, there's a war global going around, the geopolitical issues that need to get resolved all, you know, new technologies that are moving, you know, at a crazy pace. And at the same time, we're really talking of businesses, you know, and industries being able to adapt. I mean, if everyone moves to public transport, what happens to the private automobile industry? How, how will they look at that? Even if it's a 50 year or 20, 30 year, you know, kind of a time frame. So in your view, you know, what should Indian business, at least let's talk of India, right, be thinking when they're thinking of the next 25 years, right, especially in light of, you know, green growth? Uh, and, and what could be incentives or, you know, regulation uh, that the government can come in? Because you mentioned government, right? There could be some things that can be kind of enforced through regulation, something that could be incentivized. Is it a combination of both? You know, some of your thoughts on, 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 on these subjects. Well, you know, I think CII has uh, shown uh, that there is a lot 
that uh, in CII industry can do on a voluntary basis. Hmm? But there is also a role for uh, regulation. There is a role for rule setting. Okay. The, the challenge has always been to find that happy medium, you know, between voluntary action and, uh, and rule setting. Now, for instance, let's talk of buildings. You know, uh, we know that buildings uh, in India, 80% of the buildings that are going to be required by 2047 are yet to be built. You know, now when we build these buildings, if we don't build buildings which are sustainable and use less energy, use less water, less emissions, Okay, you're locking that in otherwise. And buildings can last even 100 years. So if you don't do something early, you know, you will lock in uh, unsustainable uh, practice. And CII recognized this uh, 20 years ago when we set up uh, the Green Business Center. And the Green Business Center in CII was essentially about how do we manage the transition to sustainable industry? We talk of energy efficiency. Uh, we've talked of uh, how companies uh, can self-regulate. We talk of uh, how uh, products can be rated uh, for their greenness, et cetera. And so what has CII done in that process? You know, it has, it has uh, promoted green buildings, uh, rated green buildings, not just for the commercial or residential sector, but we have for hospitals, for schools, for townships, for, uh, you know, for all sorts of uh, different types of interventions that are required. Now, this is a voluntary activity. And how did we go about doing that? We were the, in a position to convince people who are bi building, putting up buildings, developers, you know, owners of buildings, et cetera, that it is in their interest from a long-term perspective to have a green building. This, this journey, has taken us 20 years, but it is so satisfying that we today have the second largest stock of green rated buildings in the world. And uh, I think this is something you can say is voluntary action, you know? But look at, for instance, if you want all home appliances to be energy efficient, you have to have a rating system. You have to have a, uh, a rating system that puts everybody on the same level. So you have a star rating system. It applies to home appliances. It applies to automobiles for their consumption of fuel, etc. Uh, so this mix of voluntary action and regulation, I think getting that right is really important for industry. And I mean, the fact is, you know, when, we, when I say that we are going to build 80% of our buildings, we're going to need lots of steel. We're going to need lots of cement. OK, <laughs> and lots of uh, glass, all of this are heavy energy consuming industries. And so these are sometimes they are known as, you know, hard to uh, abate in terms of their emissions. Uh, but there are there are lots of technologies out there today that are taking place. And I think one of the nicest things that has happened in India is this startup culture. And the startup culture is allowing highly educated young people, you know, to, to think out of the box total uh, for anything, you know, whether it is to do with education, to do with how do you make green hydrogen or, you know, whatever you do. Uh, so then I think this uh, entrepreneurial uh, bent of mind that I think almost comes down uh, to a lot of Indians. Uh, is something I think that that will stand us in good stead because we will need huge amount of interaction with universities and technology institutes. We'll need, you know, a much closer interaction between industry and academia. We will need uh, the whole startup seed in India making a difference in the way industry moves forward. We'll need all of this. And by having it all, uh, and coming together, you know, this integration of all these different uh, ideas uh, is really what is very powerful. I think when you when you look at any one intervention, 
you know, by itself, it doesn't give you the same level of uh, uh, power and, and, and result, you know, but it's when things come together that it makes a difference. And whether it's for industry, whether it's for agriculture, uh, you know, all of this is very much dependent on getting the system right. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of industry and manufacturing is that it provides high paying jobs uh, in relation, in, rel in relative terms compared to agriculture, say. You know, if we have to move, you know, 500 million people from agriculture to industry, that's a humongous job, you know. It's, it's not only about education and training, but it's about providing the opportunities, which means you need the growth in industry. So I would say that, you know, let's think holistically. I think we, we tend to think uh, a little bit too siloed. You know, we have to think about these big challenges uh, from a systems approach, you know. Uh, and it's not only about technology. You know, it's about social systems. You know, how do you, 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 have to, you have to be able to convince people as we move along, you know, that this is good for them, uh, that they need to also think that, you know, not just education, but skill training, for instance, uh, is crucial. You know, we know, for instance, that, you know, in Western countries, electricians, plumbers, and other skilled uh, technicians earn extremely well. They are part of the middle class. And there's no reason why that should not happen in India either. Yeah. No, I think, I think you bring out this interdependency, you know, and the, the social fabric so beautifully because ultimately every community or, you know, the world has to be one community around, you know, green growth, you know, green livelihoods, green way of understanding their own consumption, you know, and for industry particularly, you know, to be able to, to, to shape that. But one more thing, Jamshid, you know, you talked of, you know, voluntary action and you talked of regulation, right? Between these two, there's also this incentivization that tends to work well, especially if you want to see manufacturing as a, you know, growth driver for, you know, or, or green growth coming through manufacturing and many of these other areas. You know, are we doing enough? Uh, is there something more, you know, a government can do? You know, we know this PLI, you know, for example, has triggered, you know, some, a lot of action in manufacturing. Uh, I don't know, you talked of startup, maybe, you know, some sort of uh, prioritized funding, both from government, but also supported by industry, specifically to, to promote this green community kind of concepts. I don't know, but any thoughts around incentive as a, as a driver for this? <laughs> yeah, you know, this, there has always been this debate on incentives, you know, uh, do you give uh, cash incentives or other incentives uh, to encourage people to go into manufacturing or do you provide the environment uh, and the basic, uh, you know, the basis that you need, you know, you provide uh, industry with good uh, industrial uh, parks, uh, fully equipped with all the necessary infrastructure of roads, power, water treatment, you know, all of that. Uh, so what is actually more important? You know, because this debate has been there forever, as far as I can remember, you know. And I always believe that it has to be a mix of the two. You know, you can't go overboard on either one. But having world-class infrastructure, you know, is really one of the biggest incentives for industry because the hassle for industry to set up a manufacturing unit somewhere, you know, could be enormously uh, time consuming and expensive. Whereas the government actually, and state governments, even more than the central government, it's local governments, state governments, they can do an enormous amount uh, to actually uh, provide the right type of incentive, which is the right infrastructure. But, you know, the social systems in that are very important. That means the people who are charged in government with promoting industry, you know, have to look at this, not that, you know, I've been able to attract GE and, uh, and Boeing to come to India. That's not what's going to drive it. What's going to drive it is facilitation. That means it 
in, industry must be treated as a uh, uh, as as a as a sort of a welcome uh, organization in every part of the country, and people must go. The government people must go out of their way to facilitate, make it happen, uh, and do it fast. I think this is a crucial point. The difference between a lot of Southeast Asia and India is that that one of the reasons why Southeast Asia has become so industrialized is because the government at every level, you know, local, state, central, put a lot of emphasis on facilitation. And I think this is what we need to do. But it doesn't mean that PLI schemes don't have a role. They certainly do have a role, you know, because it's a time-bound program. You know, it, it's, it gives you that little bit of incentive to push you into doing it. But once you've said, okay, I want to do it, you must also be able to do it in an environment which is uh, uh, accepting and nurturing and, and allows you to do it quickly. So I think both are really important. Uh, I, I will give you the example of Vietnam only because I know about Vietnam because I you know, uh, use the, their uh, facility in Vietnam uh, to attract uh, investors. What one simple change that they made, uh, you know, and this was made actually in conjunction with uh, the Singapore Investment Board and others, you know, people, people who wanted to, 20 years ago, who wanted to take an interest in developing Vietnam, you know, and they worked it out. Now, you could say that Vietnam has a different government system from India. Yes, of course it does, no doubt. But the simple change they made was that they created industrial parks where the authority to approve anything, you know, whatever it is, all permissions, all customs clearances, taxes, everything was located with individuals, small group of individuals who was like a management uh, group, you know. And this made a huge difference. Vietnam was able to, you know, in 20 years, they have been able to attract so much investment by this one change, nothing else. You know? So I think we also need to think about what are those simple uh, governance changes that we could think of in India that work in our system, you know? that, that will be the facilitator. And I think that this, if we could do something more on this, you know, would be a big incentive for people to uh, start factories, et cetera. No, I think very, very powerful thought. And, you know, also when you do it around a subject, you know, that is time sensitive and critical, uh, I think it gives a great opportunity for government, private sector, civil society, everyone to really come together also, you know, to build some consensus, right? In India, probably, Jamshed, the little the way we'll do it differently, build a little more consensus, but still ensure that it gets done, you know, and I think that process will probably be also very, you know, very, very sustainable. And, you know, when you talk of infrastructure, I think one big piece of, I don't know, missing infrastructure or maybe not adequately funded or adequately uh, important, you know, in our discussion of things, especially when we compare, you know, to the rest of the world is our entire academic institution, especially when it comes to, you know, higher education and, you know, the collaboration between industry and academia, in a country like India, you know, the scale at which it needs to happen and the scale at which it's happening today, you know, even our R&D investments as a private sector are much smaller compared to, you know, the rest of the world, whether it's innovation and this entire area of green and growth is so much about all of those factors, right? So how do you look at that particular, you know, synergy, industry, academia, what can we do more? What can we do differently? Do we consider it, you know, as a separate you know, very important piece for us to consider. Yeah. No, actually, you've talked uh, of uh, education as, as a very, very important uh, driver uh, of innovation and growth. And no doubt it is. But I think that, you know, the IIT brand, for instance, is now known all over the world. Some of the, you know, the leaders of some of the biggest companies in the world went to IIT. So I'm less worried about, you know, institutions like IITs. What I'm really worried about, actually, 
is is the base of the pyramid here. Uh, you know, I think that uh, unless you get your education level, you know, at the bottom, uh, properly settled, you will never be able to uh, achieve the numbers of people who would be able to go to IITs and IIMs, etc. So the emphasis on primary education, you know, pre-primary education, primary education, and secondary education. Frankly, to my mind, that is far more important than the higher education. I'm not saying we shouldn't have higher education. Of course, we should have higher education. But the emphasis, you know, in terms of uh, policy, uh, in terms of encouragement, in terms of, uh, you know, how do you provide high quality basic education which is reading, you know, mathematics, uh, uh, exposure to uh, uh, science, you know, all of this. How do, we, how do we do that? You know, I think in a way, if you ask me where we have failed in the country is not in IITs. I think thanks to Jawala Nehru, who had that vision, you know, that we have to have these models of uh, uh, modern, modern temples of India which is absolutely right. I mean, I, I have nothing, I don't deny that that was necessary. But the emphasis on primary and secondary and uh, uh, pre-primary education, I think we have missed out on that. Uh, I'm sure there are many, many reasons for it. Uh, India is a country with many languages, uh, many approaches, uh, culture is different in different parts of the country. So, but, but somehow, we have not been able to get uh, basic education to the level that we need, you know, and that would then lead to, you know, people being more skilled. You know, you have, you yourself have uh, taken so much effort in in developing a skill uh, development. You know, uh, I mean, skills, and you can build on the skills so well, you know, and income generation if the basics is right. So yes, everybody doesn't go to college. Everybody doesn't need to go to college. You know, but there's lots of other jobs uh, uh, that are good jobs, pay well-paying jobs uh, that you could have. You know, you could be an electronics uh, technician. You could be all sorts of things. And I think we are missing out on that part: the basic education and skill development. And I would put much more emphasis on that because this will be the building block to reach the you know, the vision of 2047. Uh, because that vision is not going to be reached if the people of the country are not in a position to actually be ready for that. So I, I would just say that, yes, uh, by all means, you know, higher education is important. Research is important. Academia, industry, cooperation is crucial. Yeah, but let's do more on the basics. Yeah, no, I think, you know, and on this point, particularly Jamshed, you know, I think there's a big role, maybe, I don't know, for, you know, for even philanthropy to come in and, you know, to strengthen this because if this is our single largest priority and it's often discussed, right, between primary education, affordable healthcare, you know, these are very clearly top of the mind for everyone who, you know, worries about India. Uh, is is this like is there an opportunity for you know philanthropy and you know you're one of those few people who walk the talk and closely observe you you know you do you do a lot more than what you say you do and I've seen that at work and you know for someone who really operates like that from the heart and is able to mobilize resources yourself do you think that industry you know of, of, family offices that are, you know, now making investments and now looking at family philanthropic activities, you know, uh, at, a, at at many levels, right? Uh, you know, government, in whatever we talked of, uh, you know, social work, uh, many, many other aspects coming together to drive primary education. Is that one way in which, uh, you know, we can move ahead as a society? Yeah, you know, let me say that there's no doubt that there's a role for philanthropy. But there is a role uh, for getting education policy right. You know, I think one of the big things that is missing 
is uh, the way that teachers actually teach. You know, uh, I think we put we have put over the years. You know, we have put a lot of emphasis on teachers following textbooks in a way uh, that you know people have to memorize things and 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 appear in exams and you know score ninety nine point nine percent marks to get into college. You know, that is not education. That's not learning. You know, I think I think we need to think through, you know, where we have actually failed in basic education. Uh, what is it that has changed? Uh, and in this, the role of philanthropy is, of course, important. You know, not just to set up schools, but also for philanthropic organizations involved in education policy, say, you know, to work with governments uh, at every level. You know, there, there are good examples of that in India where philanthropic, large philanthropic organizations have got themselves involved uh, in basic education. They work with the state government. They work with teachers uh, because teachers also have to be uh, adequately trained, etc. But I think that uh, just like we talked about in industry, you know, it's an ecosystem of things falling in place uh, that will really make a difference. You know, uh, we, we should we should realize that uh, good education policy can make a huge difference. You know, I'll, I'll only give you one example of my family. Uh, you know, my, my father and mother and grandfather, all of them actually uh, from right from the beginning, you know, they put a lot of emphasis on schooling. And the reason is because, you know, the people that we used to employ 50 years ago, uh, actually couldn't read and write. You know, they, they, this, was, this was the situation. You know, it was rare that uh, a factory worker could read and write. And so we started in our company, we started a school. You know, we started at the pre-primary, then primary, then secondary. And I mean, if you put a lot of emphasis on teaching and learning as opposed to passing exams, you know, I think you can make a big difference. Uh, I know I I used to hear these stories uh, about you know uh, why is it that we can't uh, you know take classes under a tree, you know just like uh, it used to be done at Shanti Niketan in Tagore's time, you know that sort of thing. So what is it that's necessary, you know that that will make a difference in our approach to education, to education to make people learn rather than pass exams. Now, I'm happy to say that we are in a position now that in our schools that we can do both. You know, we are really making people think and learn. But at the same time, the school, you know, has 100% distinction uh, passing for all its students. So it's this is the sort of combination that is really important. But I, I, I mean, this, it's a huge subject, uh, uh, education by itself. Uh, it has had political ramifications over the years. Uh, there are language issues. There are all sorts of other things. But the emphasis on, on basic education, you know, and actually I would like to hear, uh, say, our prime minister, you know, the way he used to passionately talk about Swachh Bharat, you know, cleanliness, uh, you know, talk about uh, an India that is really uh, concentrated, you know, on how do we make our young children sort of learn and educate and become wonderful citizens. Uh, this is something I think that that would be a great national debate and very important for achieving our vision of 2047. Oh, and especially at a time, uh, Jamshid, when the world is dealing with aging populations and it's probably the Indian, you know, who is going to drive a large part of the global, you know, uh, economy as we move forward. And also at a time where learner-centric becomes so critical because you hear generative AI, you hear, you know, skills having to move from one to the other, you know, the adaptability needed, you know, to, uh, to be able to be productive and efficient citizens of society. I think of all things that, you know, will will come up and you know you were talking of your earlier era where at least people came you know with a 
uh, kind of a career for a lifetime. Where nowadays people are looking for a lifetime of careers and we need to. I mean, it'll be forced to kind of look at that. So adapting and becoming, you know, a learner-centric society is so, so critical. And I agree with you. You know, we can talk for hours on that subject. And I'm going to take you up on that because it's also a very, very important agenda and piece for us as we're thinking of, you know, India at 100. And, you know, in that context, you know, our role in the world. But coming back to a little bit on green because I know we are kind of running out of time. But really, you know, you talked of other nations, you talked of Vietnam, you talked of many other countries doing, you know, different things that, you know, have inspired many others to do more. I'm sure in India also we have seen success stories, right? There are best practices. We always talk of pockets of excellence in India. What we really need is being able to scale those, you know, those efforts and those, you know, initiatives to a larger base and maybe even inspire other nations you know, to take on what India has created. In your, you know, entire career and looking at this subject so closely, you know, is there some success story, best practice, particularly that you feel, you know, that you can share or that stands out that we can scale or other countries can benefit from? Yeah. Well, Rajan, you know, this is one area where the leadership at the very top of the organization makes all the difference, you know. I think if you have a CEO and a chairman and a board, you know, that is really focused on this area, you know, it will transform industry everywhere. Uh, at the best example, you know, is companies like Unilever and some of the other, you know, companies which have, uh, which are global companies, but have taken on this role of being evangelical uh, as far as green is concerned. You know, so it's important that you have a CEO uh, who believes in it. You know, it's one thing to say that I have to do a little bit of box ticking because somebody has asked me to do it. Hmm? Some regulator has asked me to do box ticking. Okay, that's not green. Okay, it has to come uh, that you believe that you have to do it because it's the right thing for your company. Okay, it's 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 a matter you know it's like when i was talking of green buildings i mean when we started out you know to convince people to do a green building uh, was a, a humongous task okay until all the rest of the infrastructure started to fall in place okay but we convinced them that it was in their interest to do it and people at the top took it you know uh, the late mr deveshwar you know in itc when i talked to him about it and I said, you know, you are in hotels, you are in so many, uh, you know, why don't you think of this from the point of view of your customer? Your customer in a hotel will be much happier, you know, if he knows that he's actually staying in a green hotel, you know. And these are the sort of things that, you know, if the CEO picks it up, you'll run with it. So I think it's very important in CII that we also, you know, whilst we're doing everything else that we're doing, you know, we also work on the mindset of, of leaders that of what is really critical, what is important, what will help them in their own journey. Uh, but this is really crucial. I mean, most things I would say is bottom up that works, you know. But in this area, you know, it has to be top down. The CEO, the chairman makes all the difference. So I think one more one more piece for people to look for in the identify the right CEO is just making that job so much more difficult. But you know, I think you hit a very important point of this transformation in people, right? I mean, even tomorrow is CEO have it, others have it. This has to percolate in the eight billion people who inhabit Earth. I mean, in our company, you know, through our digital company, what we have really started something is called the individual social responsibility and then ISR score, which is purely based on your consumption habits, right? How do you, how much water do you consume? How sustainable you are? And, you know, we use that as a score to do a lot of things, but I'm sure many other companies are also to doing things like that, but we have to create a national or a global kind of a movement to, to bring that change. Because if that changes, I think the world will follow, right? I mean, one of the reasons 
they have gone the other way is because maybe a large part of humankind has transformed the other way. You know, we become very materialistic, our consumption habits have become, you know, so driven by other factors. So I think that shift which you touched upon is a very critical yeah. point. And and I, I think can provide that. Yeah. The other thing is that, you know, over the years, you know, the business community celebrates people who make huge profits, right. you know, okay. They don't celebrate people who have made a difference uh, on sustainability as much as they should. It's happening more and more, no doubt. But I think, you know, that mindset is still that, you know, my job is to make as much profit as possible. And yes, there is a school of thought behind that. And there's no doubt. But why is it that you cannot say that I want to make as much profit as possible, but I also want to be green and sustainable at the same time? And that is, I think, the real uh, challenge for CEOs. No, I think, I think, and you know, that's that's a, such a powerful <laughs> thing. And this is a message that not only has to go to them, but, you know, as we said, there are a lot of young entrepreneurs in India, business leaders, you talked of people, you know, who are going to shape the future of not only, you know, our economy in India, but the world economy. And they need to bring sustainability, you know, as a core part of, their thinking, uh, especially when you talk of, you know, all the aspects, right? Whether it's the energy, is the relationship with, uh, you know, how you look at sustainability of that and, and the cross-section of consumption and many, many factors. So what, you know, Jamshed, as we are, I mean, I'm just looking at the clock and we've way, way past our slot, but I cannot end this without asking you this question and is what is your message, you know, to that young entrepreneur from India, or young entrepreneurs around the world, you know, one in 10 people in the world today is an Indian under the age of 25 who's going to, you know, go into the mainstream world in some shape and form. What's your message to them? Yeah. You know, I, when I think of this question, the one person who always comes to my mind is the late Professor C.K. Prahlad. And, you know, he always made it a point of saying, that successful businesses, successful CEOs will be those who can see the vision of innovation and sustainability together. You know, if, if you can do that, you are built for the future. You know, that, that was his point of view with many, many such examples. Uh, you know, and I still believe, you know, today that businesses have to be innovative. You know, there's no way, you know, you can't be stuck in one way or the other. Uh, but doing innovation and sustainability at the same time in everything that you do, whether it's a service, it's a product, you know, whatever it is, this is very powerful. And so my message to entrepreneurs, you know, startups and everyone is, yes, of course, you know, innovation is very powerful. You know, new ideas, new ways of doing things is very powerful. But at the same time, for your longevity and for making your business, you know, robust, you know, the sustainable aspect of that is crucial. So I think that's the way to, to think and advise young people, entrepreneurs, etc. that think of it that way, that, you know, you need both if you want to be successful. And it's so, it's so befitting that you bring up CK Pralad because the entire India at 75 vision you know, which started 15 years ago by CII, was inspired by his, that one talk on India at 75, and then number of years of effort he put in, you know, to align industry, government, you know, society to make that happen. And it continues, Jamshed, to be, you know, the, the driving factor for India at 100, right? The principles of transformation, like what you rightly said, continue to be as relevant today as they were 15 years ago for the next 25 years, at least, you know, for India's journey. And what you rightly said, he used to talk of the non-negotiables of innovation in, in that same context. And I know you and so many other business leaders in India, and I also personally been touched by that and why sustainability and environment were very critical. He also talked of scale and affordability, you know, which goes back to your opening comment of today's discussion about your vision, you know, for India of creating an equitable society. I think it's so important that we think of all of that, you know, as, as one interconnected ecosystem 
and you know innovate within that you know as we uh, surge ahead to India at, at, at 100 and I don't think I could have asked for a better conversation a far more enriching conversation uh, I have also learned so much and I'm sure everyone who has joined us here and you know large part of this conversation Jamshed is going to go global we are taking these conversations to Asia we're taking it to the western world because what is India's thinking what is the thinking of India Inc and India leadership today, as we are looking at the next 25 years, is very important, you know, even for the world to kind of understand. So thank you so much for your time, uh, for, you know, your, your thoughts. And, and I'm going to keep, you know, coming back to you <laughs> for a lot more of uh, both your thought leadership, you know, and of course, a large part of your own action uh, to helping us all collect actively shape the future of India. So thank you. Thanks, Jamshed, again for, for joining us. Thank you very much, Rajan. I think what you're doing by talking about the vision of India at 100 is really remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.